Reunión eh, de esta mañana va a empezar, eh, bueno, va a hablar ahora Christine Lotter. Eh, ¿Hablo en español o en inglés? Estoy viendo. Bueno, yo creo que en español. <risa> sí, este. Ok, Christine Lotter es, eh, estudia cristografía y eh, tiene eh, mucho interés en aplicaciones de teoría de números y de geometría algebraica en cristografía. Eh, se, se reconoce su trabajo principalmente uh -huh. por eh, la cristografía de curvas elípticas, trabaja en Microsoft y, eh, bueno, este año ya no, este año terminó su mandato como presidenta de la Asociación para Mujeres en Matemáticas. Eh, estudió en la Universidad de Chicago, trabajó en el Max Planck Institute y eh, tuvo una un puesto investigadora como en el Hildebrand, eh, Hildebrand Research Assistant Professor en la Universidad de Michigan. También eh, ha sido investigadora visitante en Lumini, en Francia. Es eh, cofundadora de la red de mujeres en teoría de números y eh, bueno, ha trabajado mucho en la cuestión de mujeres en matemáticas. Eh, es parte del eh, comité directivo de BANF y del consejo de la eh, Sociedad Matemática Americana. Ella, con sus coautores, ganaron un premio, el Selfish Prize, que se da a los mejores artículos que se presentan en el Algorithm Number Theory Symposium, eso fue en 2008, por su artículo Computing Hilbert Class Polynomials y es Fellow de la American Mathematical Society desde, desde 2015. Eh, actual, bueno, se le dio el Fellow de la Asociación de Mujeres en Matemáticas en la clase inaugural en el 2015 y habla perfectamente español. <risa> <risa> es un placer tenerla con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias, Cristina. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias para invitarme. Uh, soy, estoy muy contenta de estar aquí para uh, festejar uh, 75 años y felicitaciones. Es muy, muy bueno 75 años. Y um, yo uh, estaba aquí en México hace 25 años más o menos. Cuando estaba estudiante, uh, yo pasé uh, dos veranos aquí en, en México, uno uh, en Simbestave y uno en Juan, en Ixtapalapa. Entonces, uh, todo el mundo en ese tiempo, yo estaba estudiante, todo el mundo estaba muy simpática, eh, ayudándome y todo. Entonces, siempre pienso en México, en uh, un muy buen lugar para hacer matemáticas. <laughs> Entonces, uh, Actually, I forgot, maybe I should give my talk in English. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to succeed in saying all these words in Spanish. And, and um, so for those of you who uh, don't speak Spanish, don't worry, no more Spanish. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be here and I'm going to talk about uh, my work in uh, introducing actually super singular isogeny graphs into cryptography, a new hard problem that we introduced in 2005. Uh, so this work is a little bit old but I'm taking the opportunity to talk about it because it's recently got a lot of renewed attention and lots of new papers being published in this area because it's a candidate for standardization in the NIST post-quantum cryptography competition, which is starting this year now, just last month. So if you remember one thing from my talk, this is a picture, you'll see a bigger picture later. This is a picture in Science Magazine that appeared in 2008 of a super singular isogeny graph. So, That's, that's the picture of, of what I'll be talking about. But I'd like to take the opportunity to um, kind of have it's kind of like four parts of my talk. Just to talk about cryptography in general and the threat that comes from the advent of quantum computers. And just to talk a little bit about the history of mathematics in cryptography, the hard problems that are used. And then to talk about super singular isogeny graphs and to talk about the hardness and the very interesting problems in number theory there for attacking these. So those are kind of the four parts of my uh, talk. 
And one of the reasons for, of course, I can't give a whole course on public key cryptography in one hour, so I'm sorry, some parts will be a little bit condensed. But one of the reasons for trying to cover this is the kind of meta message here is to give an idea of the importance of mathematics in cryptography and the time span for proposing and attacking new problems and the communities that actually work on these problems. And so there's a very interesting interaction between mathematics, computer science, industry, and government in these problem spaces. And it's one of the nice things about working in cryptography. So what is cryptography? So people often think cryptography is just the science of keeping secrets, but it's actually much more than that. Um, beyond confidentiality, another really key piece of cryptography is authenticity. So uh, you can think of cryptography as really being the foundation of security for our you know, internet and e-commerce based society. So everything that you do on the internet and with email um, is secured through cryptography. The main tools, so there's essentially three main tools that are universally used from cryptography around the world and so they are also standardized, for example, in, in the United States by NIST, National Institute of T uh, Standards and Technology, and in other countries by other uh, government associations. And they are encryption schemes, digital signature schemes, and key exchange. So these are the three things for which we have public key primitives based on hard math problems. And these are the three tracks of the current NIST competition that, that started last month. They are trying to standardize new schemes in all three of these things. So um, key exchange, what is key exchange? That's just two parties need to exchange information publicly, but then they need to use that exchange to agree on a, a common secret. So that's uh, key exchange, and that's used in every HTTPS browser session. So if you make a secure connection somewhere with your browser, you're using uh, key exchange. Um, Sorry, signature schemes. Signature schemes allow parties to, it's like as if you have a phone book that's been published, and now you want to have, somebody comes along, and they want to be able to sign something, and then you can check in the phone book, and using the information, the public information in the phone book, you can check if it was really them that signed this. So this gives authenticity if you believe that the phone book is correct. And the phone book is called PKI, Public Key Infrastructure. And then third, the encryption. Encryption is the most common thing that I think people know about in crypto of, of, of cryptography. It's just taking information and encrypting it. It's kind of like locking it into a black box, and you keep the key. And if nobody that, if, if you don't have the key, then you don't know what's in the box. That's the whole idea of encryption. So examples of public key crypto systems that I'll talk a little bit more about are RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, digital signature algorithm and elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, all of which are standardized around the world by many organizations. So public key uh, cryptography, the, name, the word public should give you a clue. Public refers to the fact that there's some public information and public communication, but then there's this goal, each of those three goals was different, the ones I just went over. And, but the security of these systems, the interesting thing about public key cryptography is the security relies on the hardness of hard math problems. So you can tell everyone what the problem is, what the hard math problem is, and the fact is that we rely on the fact that people don't know how to solve these math problems algorithmically. So that just shows you that mathematics is a key part of the foundation of cryptography. So sometimes I'm actually surprised that math, uh, cryptography doesn't get used more as an example of the importance of, of mathematics. It's, very, it's really fundamental. So some of the hard problems that are very well known since more than 40 years, factoring large integers and the discrete logarithm problem in a, basically a finite multiplicative group, um, and then since about 30 years, these uh, related problems on elliptic curves. And I'll say a little more about that later. So as I mentioned, key exchange is used in um, secure browser sessions, the SSL TLS protocol. Um, signed encrypted email uses uh, both encrypt uh, encryption and authentication, the SMIME protocol, virtual private networking, IPsec protocol, and authentication X509 uh, certificates. 
So these are just a, a few examples of the standards that go along with these hard math problems and allow us to actually use these systems in practice in the industry and in government. So now that you've been fully convinced of the importance of public key cryptography, now we have a problem. The problem is that lots of people are working very hard on building quantum computers, and they're making progress. And quantum computers exist at a very small scale, and they, the fundamental challenges are around how to scale them up so that quantum computers can do larger scale computation. But once we have quantum computers that exist at scale, unfortunately, our public key crypto systems are going to be vulnerable to polynomial time attacks using the quantum computer. And so that is why NIST is now trying to standardize over the next five years post-quantum cryptography systems so that we will have something to replace our current systems with once we have quantum computers. So this is kind of the fundamental motivation right now. There's this new wave of, of research in cryptography uh, basically for this reason. So what do we know about quantum computers? So the idea was introduced in the 80s uh, by a number of people, including uh, Feynman, but also including Yuri Manin, a mathematician. Um, in 2001, Shor's algorithm was used to demonstrate a factorization of the number 15. So that might not seem very impressive, uh, factoring the number 15, uh, used a seven qubit computer. And I've been told by certain experts that even in the factorization of 15, they cheated. They used the fact that they knew the factorization of 15. <laughs> I don't exactly understand what they mean by that, but I thought it was funny anyway. So um, there's been a lot of progress both in industry, new companies such as D-Wave being um, spawned, huge investment from big companies like Microsoft, um, Station Q, and uh, Microsoft has released a quantum compiler named Liquid. Um, we, uh, we've uh, heard news, for example, in the Snowden leaks that NSA had spent uh, something like $80 million in a program to develop a quantum computer, or at least to maybe understand um, the, the obstacles better. Obviously, we did that secret. We don't know what's been done, but certainly there's been a huge amount of vest investment from both government and industry in building quantum computers. So we don't know exactly when it's going to be that we have full-scale uh, quantum computers, but it certainly looks like it will be a reality in the future. So once we have quantum computers, there's a couple of interesting things to note. One is that arithmetic is going to be different. So quantum arithmetic is very different than arithmetic that we do on computers today. Computers today operate on series of bits, and we have basically two kinds of gates, AND and OR gates. And all circuits are um, kind of composed of AND and OR gates, and so all algorithms that are implemented on a computer are kind of converted into some version of you know, AND and OR gates to be a circuit that's, that's, uh, that's implemented. Um, quantum arithmetic will look very different. So the basic operators are these things kind of like Hilbert operators. And it, even some in, very interesting work that I've been involved in recently um, shows that even to express a certain function or operation that you want to implement with a quantum computer can involve solving a problem which is like a word problem, meaning um, a word problem meaning you have some generators that don't com commute and you want to express an arbitrary element in terms of some sequence of these generators in some particular order. And so it's very interesting that quantum arithmetic itself is very, will be very different once we... So that means that even basic things like uh, multiplication and division in a finite field are not yet really very, very well known or established in terms of how you would do them on a quantum computer. So we just published a paper this week with the first algorithm for Montgomery multiplication and Montgomery inversion in a finite field. So that should just give you a snapshot of where we are, status quo. For quantum arithmetic, we're at the very beginning in terms of what you would want to be able to do. Quantum logical gates are represented by unitary matrices. And there's lots of different kinds of uh, possible designs uh, that could be realized. We don't know which physical instantiation of a co quantum computer will be realized. And so we don't even know how to design algorithms yet, because algorithms could have different assumptions, like um, having 
the, the two bits that need to be operated on needing to be next to each other, for example. So there's kind of like a nearest neighbor architecture assumption. And we don't know if that's the architecture that will be realized or not. So it's a very big, open, wide open space, very exciting. And exciting for mathematicians, too, because there's a lot of mathematically related problems in this area. So how bad is the situation for our cryptography systems? Well, if your crypto system is um, like M bits, so for me that means like current standard in the, in the industry, RSA, if you're going to use RSA, it'll be like 2048 bits, 2048 bits, that's the minimum. And corresponding to that, if you're going to use an elliptic curve, it'll be about 10 times smaller, it'll be about 256 bits. So if M is, for example, 256, what this is saying is, the number of um, bits that we need to actually break, uh, you, you know, implement Shor's algorithm to either break the discrete logarithm problem or the, uh, the factoring uh, problem, the number of bits that we will need, uh, qubits, is 2m. So, for example, for RSA, we would need something on the order of 4,000 bits, whereas for ECC, we would only need somewhere on the order of 500 bits. And the attack time is also kind of polynomial in the number of bits. Um, it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it was six, I'm sorry, it was six M for elliptic curve, not two M. Two M was around 4,000 for us RSA. Six times 256 is, is more like around 1,500 for ECC. And the attack time is something like uh, 360 M squared, roughly. So it's, it's polynomial time, it's very, very small attack time. So um, the conclusion is, is that these systems will definitely not be resistant to quantum polynomial time algorithms once we have computers at this qub qubit size. So I now have, um, I have a, a few slides where what I'd like to do is kind of very briefly go over the known public key crypto. Um, I'm going to try to do this very quickly, so if you know it already, that's good because it won't be too fast. If you, if you don't know it and it's too fast, don't worry, because I'm just trying to give you an idea of the kind of the timeline here. RSA was introduced around 1975, so about 40 years ago. How does RSA work? Well, RSA basically, you have to publish some kind of public modulus, N, so each user, for example, would publish N. And N has a secret factorization, P times Q. Nobody knows P and Q except the person who generated the key. And the idea is that you can encrypt, you can kind of public key encrypt a message M um, by raising it to some power modulo N, where N is the secret modulus. And um, if you are an, a, a, a general person, you can do this because this exponent E is going to be public. For example, E is often chosen to be, it's almost always chosen in industry to be 2 to the 16 plus 1. So everybody knows what E is. You can encrypt by raising um, your message to this power. So now, what's the hard problem and how do you decrypt? Well, if you are a number theorist, you know that the Euler phi function is the, actually the order of the multiplicative group of integers modulo n. And from group theory, you know that in order to find the inverse of something, uh, for example, E in this group, you just need to know the order of the abelian group. This is a finite abelian group. And so all you need to know is the Euler phi function of N. And if you know the factorization and you're a number theorist, then you know that it's that, that should be P minus 1 times Q minus 1. But if you don't know the factorization, you don't know this group order, and thus you cannot invert E. And so, but if you can invert E, if you have the secret key and you can find phi of n, then you can calculate D, and you can raise this ciphertext to the dth power, and that will be equivalent to raising it to the D times E power, where D times E is uh, congruent to one modulo the group order. So you have this uh, way of encrypting and decrypting, which is based on the hardness of factoring. And again, this problem is roughly 40 years old. And when it was introduced, nobody thought that anyone could, um, could solve this uh, in, a, in our lifetimes, for example, for, for large key sizes. But what has happened in the intervening 40 years is that um, better algorithms and eventually sub-exponential algorithms have been developed to attack factoring, which has pushed the key sizes up and up and up. 
And that's a kind of a general theme of what happens when mathematicians work on these problems and figure out better solutions. Um, so uh, in elliptic curve cryptography, uh, we b base it on what's called a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange can work in any cyclic abelian group. So it can be, I mean, you could do it things more generally in other types of groups, but uh, just to make it very simple, you, you, take an, you can take an abelian group and you can take any cyclic subgroup of it. So as long as you have a generator. So let's say the generator is little g, then two parties can exchange keys, uh, but can exchange uh, information and agree upon a, um, a secret key by each picking a random value. So Alice picks A and Bob picks B. And Alice sends G to the A to Bob, and uh, Bob sends G to the B back to Alice. Now, both of them have their own secret exponent. So Alice has A and Bob has B. And that way, they can each form this secret, G to the AB, because they take what they received and they raise it to the secret power that only they know. Anyone sitting in the middle just sees G to the A and G to the B. And so the only thing they can form is G to the A plus B. So they cannot get G to the AB. So um, that's the general thing. And since, this, as you can see, this can work in any uh, cyclic group, in particular in 1985, around 1985, um, elliptic curve systems were uh, proposed where you actually use the group of points on an elliptic curve. So for those of you who are not in the area of you know, algebraic geometry and number theory, you know, elliptic curves you can just think of as this very beautiful object which has both kind of an algebraic and a geometric structure. So it's a curve, but it also has a group law that allows you to operate on the points. And for higher genus curves, things more complicated geometric structures, we also have groups that we can associate to the curves called the Jacobian of the curve. So in algebra, algebraic geometry turns out to be a very rich source of these kind of beautiful abelian groups and that we can operate on them efficiently and that we don't have, you know, uh, sub-exponential algorithms has made this a very important branch of crypt, public key cryptography over the last 30 years. So just to give you kind of an idea, um, in 2010, we hosted the 25th anniversary of elliptic curve cryptography at Microsoft Research, and we had something like around 125 researchers there. So this is a fairly large community of researchers, but it includes not only researchers in academia, it includes researchers in computer science, government, and industry. So elliptic curve, as I said, has a group law on it. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Usually the usual picture that's shown of how you operate on an elliptic curve group is there's, if you have two points, Q1 and Q2, and you want to add them together, what you do is you pass a line through them, and then you look for the third point of intersection, R1. So the philosophy here is, is that in general in algebraic geometry, and this philosophy works for higher genus curves as well, is that the group is really um, the group of uh, divisors, degree zero divisors, modulo principal divisors. Divisors are just an object which is kind of a, a smaller dimensional object on the bigger geom geometric object. But um, principal divisors are divisors of functions, which means like you have a function here which is a line, and its divisor is the divisor of zeros and poles of that function. That is, where does it hit the curve? So divisors of functions are zero in these groups. These are kind of form, formally constructed groups. And so that means that Q1 plus Q2 plus R1 should be zero in this group. And that's why to do addition in this uh, structure, you just need to know what is minus R1 because clearly Q1 plus Q2 should then be equal to minus R1 since it's the inverse of R1 in this group. So that's how it works for genus one. And I always have to show this picture because it's my absolutely favorite picture in mathematics. So I used to have it on my door and I always try to show it. So here's the picture for genus two. So genus two has, you can see it has, this is a picture over the real, so it has more holes. So it's got two holes here. And now points on the Jacobian are actually pairs of points on the curve. And so you want to add two pairs of points, P1, P2, and Q1, Q2. And what you need to do there is you need to find a function that passes through them. So you find a cubic, and you look for the other two points where it intersects the curve. Here's the equation of the curve up here, y squared equals 
could be a sextic or a, uh, or a quintic, depending on the model that you have for it. And so then in this group, this element plus this element should be minus uh, this element, which, is, which are these guys. So it's the same idea of the group law here. And so actually we showed a few years ago, it was very surprising, there are big advantages to using genus 2 over genus 1 in cryptography because we can make the field size smaller because the group is twice as big. The number of points from the Hasse-Ve theorem, the number of points on an elliptic curve over a finite field uh, of p elements is roughly p, whereas the number of points on a genus 2 Jacobian is roughly p squared, and et cetera, in terms of the genus. It's roughly p to the g in general. So we can make this field much smaller, which makes our computer arithmetic easier and faster, and yet get the same group size that we had before. So it's a, an advantage which we use to show that actually genus 2 cryptography can be faster than elliptic curve cryptography at the same security levels. So that should just kind of give you a little bit of an idea of these public key systems, which will eventually be broken by quantum computers if they're built. Um, but let's look at what has been done in terms of classical attacks on these systems. So RSA, like I said in the beginning, they thought, oh, never in our lifetime will we have you know, attacks uh, on, these, on these RSA parameters. But what ended up happening was that in the eight, late 80s and early 90s, these sub-exponential attacks, uh, kind of L1 half and L1 third algorithms, the quadratic sieve and then the number field sieve, uh, were developed. And here's the running time. The reason it's called sub-exponential is that um, so log n is the um, number of bits. So if n was the modulus to be factored, n is p times q, log, m, it, log n is the number of bits, like what I called m on that earlier slide. So sub-exponential means that it's uh, not, exp not fully exponential, not e to the power log n, but instead e to some fractional power of log n. So here it's e to the one-third power of log n times this stuff, um, and an L one half algorithm is if there's a one half power here. And then, of course, for cryptography, the constants are insanely important. These constants are what determine uh, which parameters we use in practice, because this tells us the running time of the attacks of the algorithms. So, and a nice thing to think about, you know, mathematics is such an old and deep subject. The ideas for this quadratic sieve algorithm go back to Fermat and others, but you know, in particular. Um, more than 100 years, uh, um, Dixon actually, I don't know why I don't have Dixon's name up here, but Dixon actually wrote about the ideas of the quadratic sieve in the very early 1900s. Um, and number field sieve uh, is a kind of a generalization of this idea. And uh, there's, there's still continuing uh, progress on these, these algorithms today. And this is how we determine concrete parameters to use in practice. So um, similar, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but kind of similar type of timeline and results for algorithms for the discrete logarithm problem. And uh, current, uh, currently, there are sub-exponential no algorithms known, which are even L1 fourth algorithms for small characteristic. Um, now, on the elliptic curve side, I don't know whether you noticed when I was talking about parameters in the beginning, and I said for RSA, we would need M to be 2,000. Whereas for elliptic curve, I said M could be 256. So that's a big advantage to be able to work with a much smaller field in terms of the efficiency of the crypto system. But why this difference? Well, that's because for elliptic curves, even though they were proposed around 30 years ago, we don't have sub-exponential algorithms. So we still only have exponential algorithms. The typical kind of generic algorithms for uh, crypto problems are, are usually called like square root algorithms, baby step, giant step, and Pollard row. And what that means is they, they run in the square root of the group size. So if the group size is 2 to the power 256, then that means they're running in time 2 to the power 128. And that is considered a kind of minimum security level for crypto systems today. And we don't have any generic classical sub-exponential sub algorithms. So just to get an idea of how and when elliptic curve cryptography has been used in the industry compared to RSA, RSA has been deployed for 25 years or so roughly. Elliptic curves, well, I, I like to say I spent my first five years at Microsoft Research from 2000 to 2005 working on getting our elliptic curve crypto developed and into our products. And we started shipping it in 2006 in Windows Vista 
and it's shipped in all versions of Windows and all of our, most of our other products ever since then, and it's very standard across the industry now. So think of it as roughly being 10 years old in terms of its use in the industry. And it was correlated with a, um, a very important uh, announcement, which was in 2006, the Sweet B requirements were issued by the Uni United States government, which required any a company who was a contractor to the US government to support elliptic curve cryptography. So before those, that issuance of those requirements, uh, there wasn't a huge incentive to switch over to elliptic curve crypto. But afterwards, there was a huge incentive. And so just to kind of give you a snapshot of where we are today and why, why am I talking about post-quantum cryptography, uh, just last year, 2016, NSA issued new requirements. So the CNSA document, you can look it up online. Uh, it increases the minimum bit length for elliptic curve cryptography and it advises that adoption of elliptic curve cryptography is now not required. So if you read between, between the lines, you could see that they're preparing for post-quantum systems. They're not requiring the industry to adopt elliptic curve crypto now. So the competition deadline, I think, was November 30th. So uh, NIST is now hosting a, this international competition to select post-quantum solutions, as I said, in all three of these categories, key exchange, encryption, and digital signatures. So what are the candidates? So here's where the math mathematicians come in. And here's where I believe we really have a lot of work to do. There are, roughly speaking, kind of five very well-known candidates in this area that could be standardized. Almost all of them have solutions for all three, encryption, key exchange, and digital signature. So again, think about timeline. The reason I used to say that no new system could get adopted within, the, there was always like a 10-year lag. That was true with RSA, it was true with elliptic curve, because once something is proposed, mathematicians need to have time to work on this. This is a new hard problem. How hard is it? What can we do? What are, that, what are the best ways to break it? So the interesting thing is, is that one of the leading candidates is code-based cryptography. That was actually proposed in 1978 by McLeese at Caltech. So this has been around for a long time. Uh, to be honest, working in cryptography for the last 20 years or so, I can say that there, are not, have, uh, there was not nearly as much attention in papers being published in this topic, even though it had been proposed a long time ago, as in, in, as in the other areas. But now with the post-quantum, there's a lot more papers in this area. This is another interesting one. Solving just multivariate systems of equations. So just think of lots of equations and lots of variables that are nonlinear. So those are kind of, uh, there's pro concrete proposals for multivariate crypto systems. And those proposals also go back quite a while to the, to the late 1980s at least. Um, Hash-based crypto systems around the same time frame. Lattice-based cryptography is very interesting because it enables other kind of breakthroughs in cryptography, such as homomorphic encryption, which is something that my team and I work a lot on. But a lattice-based cryptography was first proposed within the math community by um, Hofstein, Piper, and Silverman with Entru, and they launched a company, and that's about 20 years old. But it was um, independently suggested and investigated in the crypto, in the computer science community, um, normally attributed to Itai and Dwork, who proposed um, crypto systems based on hard problems in lattices, such as um, secure, uh, such as um, shortest vector problem, for example. So finally, the youngest of these is a system which I proposed with my co-authors, Dennis Charles and Ayal Gorin, in 2005. We actually presented it at the 2005 hash function workshop uh, hosted by NIST. Um, NIST was standardizing replacements for MD5 and SHA-1 at that time, and uh, we presented this as a candidate but it was uh, kind of very non-standard because it was based on a brand new assumption which we introduced, which was the hardness of routing in super singular isogeny graphs. So that will be kind of the topic of the rest of my talk here, are these super singular isogeny graphs. But hopefully with what I've told you up until now, and you can see this system is now only a little bit more than 10 years old, which is very young compared to some of the others. So basically what my, my point so far has been is, is that um, you know, math mathematics has a huge role to play in selecting and attacking and standardizing these um, crypto systems. 
And uh, we have a lot more work to do now because we have all of these new systems where we need to still understand the classical al al algorithms to attack them in addition to potential new post-quantum uh, algorithms. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the lattice space cryptography. I'd be happy to talk more about that with anyone who's interested. Um, so let me tell you about supersingular isogeny graphs. So this was a new hard problem that we introduced into cryptography. Uh, in 2005, as I said, the preprint was from 2006. And the problem is basically finding paths in graphs. So you can think of it as being that simple. You have two points in a graph that has lots of vertices, and the problem is to find a path between them. So the graphs that we're going to use are K-regular, undirected graphs, uh, and they are also really awesome expander graphs. So they have great expansion properties, and the fact that they have Great expansion comes from lots of beautiful number theory theorems underneath. Um, and they're also, the reason that we selected them as a good candidate for this problem is, is that we don't have efficient routing algorithms in these graphs. So what are the graphs precisely? Well, I mentioned elliptic curve cryptography before and elliptic curves. So now you can just kind of throw out everything I told you about elliptic curve cryptography and the Diffie-Hellman problem. In that scenario, you fix an elliptic curve and you work on that. Here, the graph is the collection of all uh, supersingular elliptic curves. So each node in the graph is an isomorphism class of supersingular elliptic curves over some large finite field, FP, or FP squared. It's known that the uh, supersingular elliptic curve always has a model in the characteristic P that's defined either over FP or FP squared. And it has then what's called a J invariant, which is a single number, which is an, an isomorphism invariant of that curve. And it is defined then either over FP or FP squared. So they're very nice concrete objects. Look, here's an equation for an elliptic curve. It's basically a cubic, as I kind of showed you the picture before. And here's the J invariant. You can see it's a very nice rational function in the coefficients A and B uh, of the curve. So that's, those are going to be the nodes of the graph. And now what are the edges? The edges are going to be what are called isogenies between the elliptic curves. Isogenies are simply, um, isogenies are simply uh, maps, which are homomorphisms, non-zero. Let's not take the zero map as being one of our maps. But um, that, the nice thing is that because the elliptic curve has this algebraic structure, like this group structure, uh, you can look at, let's say you want to take an L isogeny. An L isogeny means the size of the kernel of your map is L. So let's take L equals 2, for example. So what is a 2 isogeny in this graph? All it is is quotienting by a subgroup of order 2. And if you look at the possible subgroups of order 2, the 2 torsion on an elliptic curve has this very nice, easy structure. It's Z mod 2 cross Z mod 2. And in general, for and, and at least in, um, in general for L prime, you have this nice structure. The L torsion is Z mod L cross Z mod L. And what you can see, just elementary abelian group theory, is, is that there are L plus one possible subgroups, distinct subgroups of this abelian structure. And so what that tells us, for example, for L equals two, is there are three isogenies coming out of each, out of each node. So that gives us this very nice uh, three regular graph uh, just by taking two isogenies. And I'll show you the formulas later. The two isogenies are very easy to compute. They just require a couple of multiplications and additions in the field. So that's what an isogeny is. So here, what was the application to cryptography? So this is the first application that we introduced. And since then, many others have introduced other applications based on the same underlying hard, hardness assumption. So the K-regular graph um, has uh, each, each node has a label, which is going to be the J invariant. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct a hash function using this graph. How does this work? A hash function just takes a sequence of bits in, and it outputs another sequence of bits. And hash functions, you can ask them to have various properties. And in particular, cryptographic hash functions, 
you want them to be collision resistant and pre-image resistant, which means it's hard to find collide two inputs that collide, they have the same output, and it's hard to kind of reverse engineer an output, that, that is, find an input that maps to a given output, like a kind of a, a one-way function type of thing. So the way that the hash function is going to work based on our graph is that we're going to take an input string, we're going to divide it into chunks. In the case where we take two isogenies, we can just read it off bit by bit. So each bit is going to tell us directions, where to go. We're standing at a node, and we have three, uh, three isogenies coming out of, that, uh, out of that node. But I came from somewhere in my walk, except for my very first step. And in our, in our walk, we are not allowed to go backwards. So that means we're taking a walk around this graph, and we only need one bit at each new node to decide where to go. So I'm going to read off the input bit by bit. There's going to be a fixed publicly known starting point, and the output of the hash function is going to be the, ending, the label of the ending point of my walk. And like I said, it's very important that no backtracking is allowed. So if you can go backwards, then you can easily create collisions, because you can go along in a walk, and you can go forward and backward here, and forward and backward here, and they're going to have the same input, output, I'm sorry. So no, no backtracking, that's very important. But what that means is that, um, so here's kind of a picture. Here's a walk, here's the input, one, uh, one, 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 zero, and here's the starting point, and here's uh, two possible choices for where to go, zero or one. I'm going to follow the one path, then I'm going to follow the one again, and then I'm going to follow the zero. And the output is going to be the label of this node. So that's the hash function. But uh, what is it based on? The hardness of this, of um, finding uh, collisions is, um, you know, that, that's the underlying problem. Are there, um, is it easy to find collisions? Uh, actually, let me, let me first say, I want to admit, anybody who knows, in, who works in complexity theory or computer science, knows that this is actually a very, very standard idea, this idea of using randomness to walk around, using, um, you know, kind of uh, walks on expander graphs to generate randomness. So expander graphs actually are kind of almost, you can think of them as almost being defined by the property that if you take relatively short walks on the graph, you very quickly get to kind of uniformly distributed outputs. So this part of it was a very, very natural idea that I had encountered in many different applications in computer science. But the, I, the thing that's sp special about this application is, is that what we're trying to assume is, is that it's very hard to invert these walks and that it's very hard to find, find collisions. So just as, a, as something to keep in mind, here's a very bad idea. Use a graph which is a hypercube. Hypercube is something that is very easy to route in. So just think of two different uh, strings, which are the labels. In order to get from here to here, all you have to do is flip all the bits that don't agree. And that's a walk between these two things. So a hypercube is a terrible idea for this construction. But these, um, these super singular isogeny graphs turn out to be very interesting and so far very good for this construction. So um, the, to find a collision, what you need to do is to find um, two walks which, uh, of the same length which end at the same vertex. So essentially it's like saying these two inputs, if you could see in this graph, they would, co they would collide. So one thing that we've been able to do from a number theoretic point of view is also to place uh, congruence conditions on P to assure that there are no short cycles in our graph. So this is a pretty short cycle. And um, in general, just because there are short cycles doesn't mean you can find them, but if there are no short cycles, that's even better. So that's one thing that we have kind of insisted upon. So here we're going a little bit more deeper into the number theory and the mathematics. So let me just tell you that a very interesting thing about this graph, which is sometimes called the Pizer graph or the Master graph, is that first of all, it was used in a very interesting and deep way in the theory of modular forms. So there's something called the method of graphs, which is used for computing spaces of modular forms. That was introduced by Mestre. And it, um, was studied intensively by Pizer in a different uh, kind of language. So what we know from the work of During, for example, 
is that if you take the endomorphism ring of a supersingular elliptic curve, it's kind of a characterizing property of being supersingular, it actually has a non-commutative uh, endomorphism ring of rank four. So it's actually turned out to be a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. So for those of you that work on non-commutative things, you know that they're much harder than commutative things. And um, so this non-commutative structure is very interesting and a little bit hard to work with, but we could now replace the whole description of our graph, just forget about elliptic curves now, we can just talk about the nodes as being maximal orders in a quaternion algebra. And then the isogenies correspond to certain quotients of these orders, and you can take like the right order of one, uh, if you take the, the way that you get a path or a connecting ideal, is if you have two maximal orders and you take the right order of one of them such that the uh, left order of that is the other one. So there's these kind of connections in, the, uh, in, in between the maximal orders as well. And what was known from, I think this is called the Eichler class number, is, is that the number of such uh, um, maximal orders is roughly p over 12. So this is a very nice thing to know because now we know how big our graph is. So if we have um, picked a prime p, which is like the size we use for elliptic curves, p to the 256, that means we have something around that number of nodes in our graph. So, and if you just think back to what I talked about square root algorithms for, for standard crypto problems, you also have square root algorithms here. That is a kind of a birthday paradox. If you walk around the graph for long enough, you expect that in roughly square root time, you will find some collision. So in other words, what we're doing by picking this size prime is trying to assure ourselves that to find a collision using a generic square root algorithm will take something like 2 to the 128 time. So, um, and as I said, I mentioned earlier that the fact that these graphs have a very, that kind of optimal expansion um, constant, they're, they're Ramanujan graphs, which are optimal in some sense, that follows from very deep theorems in number theory. So it's a really nice area to study because there's a lot of interesting number theory that comes into it. And just as a, a one last note on this uh, aspect of it, the funny thing is, is that the reason that we came up with this idea to propose these graphs in this hard problem is that along with my longtime collaborator, Yal Gorin, and my postdoc, Dennis Charles, what we were actually working on was a generalization of these graphs to higher dimensions. So we were working on super special abelian varieties and, and constructing graphs and doing things explicitly for those graphs in higher, for higher dimensional abelian uh, varieties. At, but it was in 2004, 2005, right at the time when the hash function, the, the MD5 had been broken. It was a very exciting time. And so we were thinking, we had you know, kind of hash functions on the brain and got this idea of this application of these graphs, but then realized, oh, heck with that. We don't want to work with the super special abelian varieties. Those are really hard to work with. It's hard to label them. It's hard to compute any isogenies. It's hard to do anything. So he said, let's go back to the dimension one case, which is the elliptic curve case. So that's kind of where the idea came from. So um, the isogenies, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip over this in the interest of time. It's more, uh, much more interesting, I think, to show you the picture. These isogenies, uh, explicit formulas for computing isogenies on uh, elliptic curves, genus one curves, have been known since the 70s due to, to Velu. So this, again, this goes way back. Um, so using, for example, a two torsion point, if you want to just do a, a two isogeny, here's the equation for the new elliptic curve. You can see you're just kind of doing a couple of squarings and multiplications. And here is the actual map on the points. This is how it maps points. So you can see it's very, very easy arithmetic and rational functions. So that's for each step of the walk when you want to actually implement this hash function. So here's the picture I want to show you. If you remember one thing from this talk, I hope you'll remember this picture. So this is a super singular isogeny graph. Um, we created this picture for um, Dana McKenzie, who wrote an article on our work in Science Magazine in 2008 um, uh, related to our hash function proposal. So what you should be able to see from this graph is any guesses on the number of nodes here? These, these are each nodes. Guesses? There's a little over 200 nodes on this picture. 
As you can see, it's kind of hard to draw. It's kind of hard to make them all appear. Um, that's because, so this is because we picked a prime, which was somewhere around 2,000, I think it was 2,520 something, 21. You can try to c c compute whether that's prime or not. Um, but then, as I told you, the number of nodes is roughly P over 12. So if I picked around 2,500 for P, then the number of nodes had to be somewhere around um, that divided by 10. So there's some, something like around 200 nodes. And what this is supposed to kind of indicate to you, so each one of these nodes represents an isomorphism class of elliptic curves. And so if you just want to find a cycle, you know, look what you end up doing in this graph. It's just, it's not at all intuitive, you know, how, how to find a cycle. Also, to find a path, here's, here's two nodes, this one and this one. What's a path between them? You know, you end up walking all over the place. So this is supposed to give you an idea that as you scale this up, now instead of 200 nodes, if we have 2 to the 256 nodes, and you're given two arbitrary nodes, it's very, very hard to find a path between them. So that's the really hard problem underlying all the systems being proposed for supersingular isogeny graphs today. Um, so you can, you can kind of restate these problems in terms of um, the algebraic geometry or the number theory involved. And the, the problem of finding a path, you could state it as um, finding, okay, so the, there's, there's collisions and there's pre-images. So the path finding is for pre-images. Uh, pre so what it means is there's a fixed known starting point. Everybody knows what the starting point is for this hash function as part of the definition of the hash function. And an output is an endpoint. So to find a pre-image, means to find a path that is an input, which when you stick it into this function, gives you this as an output. So that's why pre-image finding is the same as path finding. Uh, an analogous thing um, for, for collisions. And in terms of elliptic curves, what it means is, given two super singular elliptic curves, find an isogeny of this degree. So if there's n steps in the path and the isogenies are L isogenies, so then you want a path of length n, which is an L to the n isogeny. So that's a kind of underlying hard problem for, for, um, for uh, pre-image finding, pre-image pre resistant of the hash function. Um, so as I mentioned, there's kind of generic square root attacks that are known. We can do certain tricks. We can ensure large girth by con putting congruence conditions on the prime, as I mentioned already. Um, there's been several different systems proposed. There was actually right around the same time as uh, we first released our preprint in 2006. After that, a preprint came out on the ordinary case, which is actually much, turns out to be much easier than the super singular case. To be honest, we actually knew that at the time that the ordinary case was easier, but this was something that might have possibly been in, in the Russian internal spy literature or something like that. We don't know. But all we know is, is that a, a preprint on the ordinary case came out after we published our work on two th in 2006. Um, on the uh, key exchange side, um, in 2011, a proposal was made. It's now called SIDH, Super Singular Isogeny Diffie-Hellman, um, relying on these, uh, this same hard problem. And recently, there have been a number of different signatures proposed, including this week at AsiaCrypt, uh, a Galbraith Petit Silva um, signature scheme. Actually, in this area, the interesting thing is there is a quantum algorithm known. It's not polynomial time, it's an exponential algorithm, but it's better than square root. So that's interesting that if you want to think about whether there's going to be quantum algorithms in this area, there has already been done, some work done there, but it's not obviously susceptible. So from the number theory point of view, and this is kind of the last thing I'll say about, about the mathematics and the number theory is, is that it gives us a very interesting target to shoot at. So this is a, a problem that you can think about it in several different ways. You can think about it in the world of Pizer, where all the nodes are maximal orders in quaternion algebras. So there we actually found what we call an L isogeny pathfinding algorithm, um, which we have kind of a heuristic analysis for. Uh, which essentially means that if you can translate from the elliptic curve description of the graph, essentially do a kind of a, 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 um, a, uh, uh, an explicit version of Durings algorithm. So if you can translate from the elliptic curve version over to the Pizer version in terms of maximal orders, then we can apply our algorithm here 
to um, find pre-images, for example. So what that leaves you with is, is this very interesting uh, situation, which is that that explicit during correspondence is very hard. So w another way to call that is it's computing endomorphism rings. So you're given a super singular elliptic curve, and you want to know what is the endomorphism ring, which is the maximal order in a quaternion algebra. You can give it in terms of a basis of elements in a concrete quaternion algebra, or you can give it in terms of actual maps that generate the endomorphism ring, either, either one of those two descriptions. And in both cases, it's, it's very hard. So actually, way back at that time, around 2005, 2006, with Ken McMurdy, we had actually worked on this problem of computing endomorphism rings. And there are algorithms that you can use to compute endomorphism rings, and they're related to the theory of modular forms. So it's a, um, the idea of computing essentially coefficients of modular forms by computing what are called representation numbers in these elliptic curve endomorphism rings and in, and in the maximal orders. But these are very bad algorithms. They're exponential, very bad exponential time algorithms. So uh, in, the, in the world of cryptography, it's not enough to have an algorithm. You want to have <laughs> a, 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 the best algorithm. And so what we don't know is, are there vastly better algorithms than these for, for computing endomorphism rings? So kind of underneath the hardness of pathfinding, you see that this kind of very nice description of a hard math problem in, in number theory. So um, essentially what I wanted to leave you with is a summary of the timelines that I've talked about in this talk. So if you think, you can see from my slide here that my very poor skills in PowerPoint. Um, but the, uh, this is RSA, so starting back around 1975 when it's proposed, a long history of attacks, and we now have sub-exponential algorithms, but it's still widely deployed just with larger key sizes. Here we are, something like 40 years later. Elliptic curves were proposed uh, about 10 years after that, so they have a kind of 30-year history. Uh, we don't have sub-exponential attacks yet, but for both of these, we know that there are quantum attacks. And then just taking a couple of the examples that I uh, gave you for the post-quantum uh, systems, Lattices were posted, proposed about 20 years ago. Um, generically, we still only have kind of exponential algorithms for those. There have been some investigation of quantum algorithms, but nothing generic is known. And the supersingular isogeny graphs are about 10 years old, so they require even more scrutiny than the rest because they are younger. And so these are um, the, all the main problems that I talked about in this talk and the classical algorithms. And, but the, Key thing is, is, is that with the new systems, you have to consider both the classical attacks and the quantum attacks. Whereas at least with the old systems, even though we know about the quantum attacks, we, we feel like we understand very well at least the classical attacks. So there's a very important difference between these two class of functions. So what the takeaway that I want to leave, leave you with is there's a lot of beautiful mathematics in cryptography. Uh, this is uh, v kind of a key moment where there's uncertain timing for the building of a quantum computer. And that means that it's very important to try to break these different proposals and understand both the classical and the quantum hardness of some of these problems. So obvious conclusion is we need more mathematicians working in cryptography. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Now, hard, that is a very fundamental question to my lecture, and I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear enough. So there isn't a precise definition of hard in the sense that we, we, we classify hardness. We talk about algorithms that run in polynomial time, sub-exponential time, and exponential time in the input size. So if you have um, a field of um, p elements, then it takes you log p bits to specify an element, and that's called the input size, log p. And an, and an exponential, uh, a polynomial time algorithm runs in time which is expressed as a polynomial in that input size. So for example, when the RSA modulus was n, the input size was log n, a polynomial was like the quantum algorithms I put there, which is some polynomial of, of, of log n. But if you have an exponential algorithm, it's essentially a polynomial of n. And in between was this formula I put up where it was e to the power, a fractional power of log n. So those are what we use to kind of quantify hardness, is these kind of classifications. And as you can see in, in cryptography, it's also very important to know the constants for the algorithm, not just the asymptotic running time in terms of the degree of the polynomial. And so when we say something is hard, we mean uh, something relative. We mean if we set 2 to the 128 as the minimum attack time that we want, that means essentially the best known algorithm runs in time at least 2 to the 128. And if you take one of the problems where there's an exponential algorithm like uh, elliptic curves, then you just need you know, to consider square root algorithms and you can set your parameters that way. And RSA was an example of where there was a sub-exponential algorithm, so the Parameter had to be much bigger, 2048, et cetera, et cetera. There's, and so hardness is relative, and I think mathematicians might find that a little frustrating, that there isn't a guarantee that the problem is that hard. There's only the fact that we know a, a set of algorithms which we can say run in a certain amount of time. Is that a satisfactory answer? <laughs> I had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, would you expect other areas of mathematics to get involved, or just number theory or algebraic geometry? Yes. Uh, and the other question is, uh, on the dark side, the, all the secret stuff, all the military stuff that's happening around the world, how do, you, how do we know what is really going on there, and, and what the relevance does it have to what, say, you guys are doing, when it's like more publicly understood? Thank you for the questions. So I think that I always think that it's very exciting to think about other areas of mathematics that can contribute to cryptography, and in particular in, um, in complexity theory. And people, a number of times in the end of talks, people have asked me, why aren't there any NP-hard problems that are used for cryptography? Or, um, for example, in topology. So there's um, kind of braid groups that have been proposed. and. Um, Oh, where was I was visiting Caltech a few weeks ago, and one of the students was proposing an idea from knot theory. Um, so I think there are more ideas to be explored, and we should be exploring those, and we should be proposing them. I'll just make a, a pitch for a new workshop that we're starting called MathCrypt, which will be one day after crypto in Santa Barbara in August. And that's supposed to be a venue for people, mathematicians, to propose new uh, crypto systems based on hard math problems and to get that kind of discussion going. So um, keep your eye out for MathCrypt if you're in another area. And yes, I think we should all be thinking about within our own areas if there's hard problems. Um, as to the uh, nefarious actors around the world, governmental and non-governmental, um, I probably can't say too much. I don't know very much. Uh, you know, we focus on the build, fundamental building blocks for the society uh, to do things that are kind of on the up and up in the, in the clear everyone knows about, but there's so many techniques that are used um, by hackers, and so often uh, systems, crypto systems, are subverted not by solving the hard math problem, but either by social engineering, basically getting somebody's password, stealing somebody's computer, infecting their computer with a virus, doing all of these different kinds of you know, attacks that have nothing to do with solving the hard math problems, unfortunately. And there are security engineers is a whole profession of people working very hard on closing those kind of gaps. So moving from the cryptography and the implementation of it to what would somebody actually use as, a, as an active technique to subvert a deployed system. And so that's a very important field as well. I think there should be more interaction between the fields.
um, I suppose this is going to strike you as a very dumb question, but in a, dumb, in a nutshell, um, what's a computer, a quantum computer? Ah, in a nutshell, we don't uh, know yet. <laughs> um, that is, okay, I'm not actually the right person to answer this question. I'll just give you my kind of high-level vision of it. Is, um, uh, in, in a regular computer, we operate on bits, and a bit is either zero or one, and, and it stays zero or one. Uh, a quantum computer does not operate on bits, it operates on quantum states, which is some physical state, and that state could be either one of the two bits, but once you measure it, then it kind of like collapses the physical process and it becomes one of the bits. And so it's this kind of uh, magic of being able to operate on things that don't have a fixed state until you measure them. So what do you think? How is that for an answer? <laughs> so, so that's about all I know. So. But there are many proposals for how to instantiate that property physically. And that's what I, I cannot give you good details on. More questions? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know much about quantum computers, but I've heard a lot of, uh, of that. And uh, before this talk, I thought that when quantum computers was uh, developed, uh, um, normal computers will be replaced by quantum computers. But here in your talk, you make uh, a lot of emphasis on, on attacks, both classical and quantum. So uh, you mentioned that the arithmetics on quantum computers are totally different from the classical ones. Uh, does that mean that uh, some, somehow classical computers and qu quantum computers are going to, to complement each other uh, rather than one replacing the other? Yes, I fully believe they will complement each other. I think it will be a long time before efficient algorithms are developed for a quantum computer that could replace most of the normal things we do, like uh, running a laptop or making a cell phone call. Um, the, I can't see into the future, maybe some fundamental innovation will come through that will change that situation. But right now, there's only a few major applications of quantum computers that are kind of known and investigated. And one of the big ones is breaking crypto systems. So that's one of the applications. Um, there are other ones in uh, chemistry, and I don't know the details of those. So, but if, if you think about what I said about the physical instantiation of a quantum computer, you could probably think that there are some processes that might naturally fit with that new quantum uh, computing structure, but a lot of other old classical things that we're used to doing that, that don't fit with it. And so uh, I don't think it'll replace uh, classical computers. I think it'll, you know, I think it'll complement it for a long time. That's a good, good, good question, though. <laughs> Interesting to think about. Thank you. One last question. No? Well, let's thank again our speaker. Remember that we, in the afternoon, is in the Instituto de Matemáticas. All the talks are there.